Okay? Can you hear me? Good sound? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for coming to this session. Um, today we are going to talk about uh, the Cloud Process Pack, as we call it. We are going to cover Charts Pack, uh, and as well as some new stuff we're introducing in R2, where I'm very fortunate to uh, have Bright with me here today. I'm just going to do a quick introduction of myself. My name is um, Anders Ravenholt, and I work for the Windows Server and System Center product group uh, on the CAD team, which deals with talking with uh, many of our customers out in the field. Um, so uh, that's one of the things that I do. One of the things that I've worked a lot on the past year has been uh, talking to service providers and enterprises about how they can run a more efficient data center uh, using Microsoft technology. So with that, I'm just going to hand it over to Vibova to do a short introduction. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Vibova Rabadas, and I'm a program manager on the Windows Azure team. So I'll be talking a little bit about the Windows Azure pack uh, section of this thing. So. So just uh, to understand uh, who we have in the room, I just want to see uh, some hands here. How many of you are using Virtual Machine Manager today? OK, that's pretty good. Um, how many of you are using Service Manager? OK, also pretty good. And Orchestrator? OK. So those are the key components we're actually going to use in the first two areas that we're going to talk about today. Because with that, I just want to uh, talk a little about the goals for this session. So the first thing we're going to cover here is uh, what we have called the Cloud Service Process Pack, which is a solution that comes from System Center that makes it a lot easier to do a private cloud. Uh, and we will go deeper into that. So that's the first area we will cover. The next area that is starting to become very popular is Chargeback, where a lot of enterprises are starting to look at how they can change some of the behavior that is driving the way that users consume IT in businesses today. Um, so Chargeback can help with um, kind of identifying how are we spending our resources, who is spending them, and how can we maybe even ask for getting some of the money back that we are spending on IT. So the people that actually consume the IT are also the guys that, that pays for it. And uh, as I mentioned before, Viper will come up here and help me talk about tenant and user tracking for service providers, which is one of the key areas that we are starting to focus very heavily on. We started in Service Pack 1. R2 has a lot of new functions and features for service providers as well. Do we have any service providers in here today? Very good. Thank you very much for coming, because I think you're going to find this very, very interesting. At least I hope you will. Uh, there's also a session after this one that, we were, that Marco Meno and Andrew Lee will be doing, where they will go way deeper into what we call the Windows Azure Pack. We're just scratching the surface of the Windows Azure Pack in terms of the chargeback areas and how you can make some benefits of that uh, by kind of looking at some of the new features that are coming in, in R2. So if you look at what has happened with System Center over the few years, the past few years here, uh, last year at uh, MMS, we launched um, all, a, a new version of all the System Center components um, where we uh, launched that at MMS last year. And uh, that was a major update for all the components. So that is only a little bit more than a year ago. Uh, and a huge major release came out for all these products. And for those of you that have worked with System Center for a while, you would probably agree with me that especially uh, products like Ops Manager, Virtual Machine Manager, but also Data Protection Manager had huge performance and feature upgrades with that new release. But that doesn't mean that we've been like sleeping and not working uh, over in Redmond, because in uh, August last year, we came out with Windows Server 2012. Uh, one of the very key areas that we came within there was virtualization, but also things like networking and storage spaces were huge um, enhancements of especially the virtualization platform, uh, but also what we call the, the fabric uh, platform within the data center. So that came out uh, less than a year ago. And then in January this year, we came out with SP1. Uh, that was an update primarily to support uh, Windows, all the new functions that we put into Windows Server 2012. Uh, so to support that from within the management stack, we released uh, Service Pack 1. And as you all know, uh, this week we released the customer preview of Windows Server and also the customer preview of all the system center components that we will be releasing later this year. So it kind of shows how quickly we're actually coming out with updates and new uh, product features and functions. And this is something we will be continuing on going forward. Uh, and R2 is really no exception here. 
Um, but to set the scene a little bit about what we're going to talk about today is really it has a lot of focus on service delivery. Um, service delivery has some certain high-level goals. One of them is agility, kind of understanding and say, how can I become agile within IT? There's more and more pressure on IT, uh, and one of the things that um, is kind of within this pressure area is uh, for IT to be more and more agile within what they're offering to their customers. Um, the same thing is really governance, where you kind of see you have to be more standardized today. There are certain things that you have to comply with. You just can't have some guy that goes out and buys his own workstation and then plug it into the domain, or people are just running around creating accounts like uh, they think uh, what they need to use. So we see a bigger, bigger need for uh, governance within the enterprise, but also within the hosters to comply with either internal uh, rules and, and standards, but also external ones uh, that they need to comply with. And then the last one we see is also a choice, that uh, the demands from the IT users or consumers are bigger and bigger, and they want to have more and more choices, and they want it faster and faster. So the choice coupled up with uh, the agility that we want it fast, and we want this big menu of choices from IT, uh, puts a lot of pressure on the IT department. So if we drill down into this a little bit, uh, the offering, which comes back to the agility, is really that I have a whole list of things that I want to offer to my uh, consumers. Um, so I want to have a standardized way of how I can do that. But once I have deployed something, once I have offered something to a user, that user comes in and say, yeah, I want a new SharePoint site. What I need to do after that is I actually need to operate it uh, and make, keep it alive and making sure that it's backed up and all these uh, operational processes that we're seeing. And then at the same time, also want to optimize what I have in my data center to run it more efficiently. So taking another double click on this, what we're then talking about when we're talking about this life cycle of how we provide IT services to our consumers of IT, the first thing we really want to look at is to create what we call a service catalog. Uh, inside this service catalog, this is where we define what we are ordering, uh, what we are offering to our users under what circumstances, how quickly they can get it. So you can think a little bit about uh, self-service offerings as a menu when you walk into a restaurant and you want a starter, you want a, a main course, and you want a dessert. You know what it costs. You have a pretty good idea on how quickly you get it. So it's kind of about setting the expectations and standardizing those offerings that you get uh, around it. So, so that's kind of what we meet with self-service uh, offerings. What comes after that is with the automation and compliance piece where if somebody goes out and orders a new virtual machine or somebody goes out and orders something where we need to stay in control, we just can't have everybody running around and ordering VMs because they think it's, it's good or it's just that I need a VM now or I need something else. I want to stay in control with what goes on with my IT resources that I'm in the power of. And to do that, we use automation and compliance to ensure that when things are ordered from or to IT, that we actually deliver those in a standardized way. And then again, on the back end of that, we want also want it to be fair and transparent, so the people that are using a lot of our IT resources should also be the ones that are paying for it. Or at least we want it to make transparent on who is using what resources, so we have a more uh, concrete dialogue with our uh, consumers when we go back and say to so finance, you use a lot of IT, see here, is there any way we can change that behavior? So <clears throat> if you walk out of here, there's really three things that I want you to remember. Those are the ones that we see here, that with System Center and Windows Server and with the whole um, private cloud and, and clouding in general, these are really the drivers that we see from that within the System Center, where we have standardization which is the way where we kind of say, let's agree upon the way that we do things in IT. Uh, we don't want one administrator to create users in one way and then another administrator creating users in a different way. We want to have a standardized way for doing that because if we don't have a standardized way that we do IT, it's going to be very fragmented and it's going to be harder to uh, administer in the longer run. Because once we have defined our standardization, so we agreed upon the ways that we want to do things, what becomes very easy to do on top of that is to use uh, automation. So the automation piece allows us to do things faster. It allows us to document what we're doing. Uh, it also allows us to make fewer errors. So that's really one of the key things we want to drive with automation, uh, to, to make sure that things happen the exact same way and very much faster than we normally do things. 
So once we have standardization and automation sorted out, we can go in and do self-service, where we actually get the users to go into a self-service portal where they can order whatever they want, wherever they want, whenever they want. So it goes very much back to what we knew from the uh, 90s where we introduced web banking, where in the old days I had to go into a bank and then I had to go to the cashier and say, I want to transfer money from this account over to this account, where today I can actually literally go outside this door, boot up my computer, log into my bank account and transfer money. It gives a lot of flexibility to me and I can do it when I want it and wherever I want it. That's the exact, exact same thing we want to do for IT here. Have, them, have the users self-service themselves and order what they want, wherever they want. And then automating those orders on the back end. Which is exactly what I'm trying to get at here, where we say System Center is really helping you deliver IT as a service within your data center. So what you see here is really the self-service piece that I just talked about, where this is where the customer goes in. They log into Service Manager using the um, service catalog and order wherever they want to, to order from IT. The next step is that we enforce that compliance piece that I talked about before. So if people want to order a new computer for like $3,000, we might want to have a, a manager in there that actually approves that it's okay that this user now spends $3,000 on a new PC. That's why we have the compliance piece. But once we have that compliance sorted out, what we'd like to see next is that we kick off the automation piece of this where we have automation tools such as Orchestrator that would go into the infrastructure and start provisioning, let's say, a new user, create the account in AD, order a new workstation, uh, assign the computer account into AD and order flowers or whatever you needs to be done every time you hire a new person. So that is how, what we mean by automating that on the back end. So we can deliver that way faster than we can today because it's probably a very manual process. And this is how we can then plug into public clouds, private clouds, virtual machines, or even physical environments. So if you think a little bit about the cloud attributes that we are talking about, and I assume you have seen slides that are similar to this one before. So what drives a lot of this goes back to what I talked about before, where uh, one of the key goals here is to create pooled resources. What we want to do with that is really to have a standardized way of the way that we categorize our storage, our compute, um, our networks in such a way that managing those becomes agnostic from the administrator and I really just have to carry out to, to carry about how I provide storage or how I provide memory or how I provide CPU to a user and I don't really have to think about what is underneath that. The same thing we also have is the uh, electricity where I want to be able to allow my customers to quickly scale up and down in the resources they are acquiring uh, down to an hour basic, where I say that uh, at the end of the month, my payroll system might be very overloaded, so I want to add more capacity to that. But once uh, it has run for a couple of days, that capacity requirement is certainly not there anymore because we've done all the payroll uh, um, to, to my employee. So after the first of the month, that system is not doing anything anymore. So I can just take those resources and move that to something else within the enterprise that needs those resources now. So it's really about changing the way I use my resources over time in the data center is what we mean by that. Self-service already covered that, but let the, self, uh, let the user self-service themselves and order what they need from IT. But then on top of that, add to say, we want to drive a more mature behavior in saying when you go in and order something from IT, we need the users to understand that everything has a cost. And as everything has a cost, we also want people to think about how they use that. Uh, so um, we know, probably know that from our homes and when we're taking a shower, hot water is very expensive. So uh, my parents always told me, you can't take an hour shower. We are paying very expensive money for this hot water. It's like, it's kind of a similar thing we want to drive over to the IT, so the stuff that is expensive, like SANS, like new servers, that we want people to think a little extra about how they utilize those resources. Um, and what we can then do on top of that is to actually say, hey, you're using a lot of computers, you have a lot of VMs, we also want you to pay for it. We don't want finance to pay for all the computers that marketing is using. So to talk a little bit about what is uh, the cloud service process pack. So 
very simply, what we did was we have the technology I just talked about before. We have the self-service portal. We have service managers that can drive the compliance for us. And we have orchestrator that can drive the automation for us in the data center. So these were kind of the areas that I talked about before that are the drivers for how we can run a more efficient data center. What we're doing here with the cloud service process pack is to apply very well-known and common scenarios such as ordering VMs or such as controlling who has access to what resources in a standardized way. And that is exactly what the cloud service process pack does. It takes, um, it takes these features and builds them on top of service manager, orchestrator, and virtual machine manager and gives me a list of options that I can use in order to drive uh, private cloud uh, common capabilities. So the way it really works is that first I want to onboard my tenant. Um, and when I say tenant, think about that just as departments or group of users that need access to uh, IT resources. So a tenant could be finance, it could be uh, marketing, it, it could be uh, other departments, but it could also be customer one, two, three, and four. So just really see it as a bunch of groups of people that need access to something. So that's the first thing we go in and we define these tenants. Once we have defined a tenant, the next thing we do is actually to say, what resources are these tenants allowed to access and consume? That's the next step we will do. And then at the end, we will then let the users provision VMs against the subscription that they have. And once they, need, they, they reach a ceiling from the nanny quotas that we have defined, we will just tell them, the party stops here. You have no more virtual CPUs to consume. If you want to provision another VM, you would rather have to delete one of those you have already, or you would have to call the IT department to request additional quota. Or you can even do that within here. So that's kind of the basic flow within this process pack. So here's what I talked about, where we have Contoso out uh, in the beginning. And then we can say marketing of finance. We'll then go in and, um, and ask for subscriptions to resources to private clouds. And then they can start uh, provisioning VMs within those uh, subscriptions. So for instance, if we have 10 and 1, that could be the marketing department. They can go in and say, hey, I want to have one cloud where I do all my testing. And then I want to have another cloud where I do all my production environment. And I have access to both environments and can uh, utilize uh, the resources within those that have been delegated based on the consumption that we defined for that tenant. So what you see here is really that we go into the offerings in the service manager self-service portal, where here you can click on cloud services, and then we have the main category called private cloud infrastructure services. Under that, you kind of see the whole lifecycle workflow for what I want to do when I self-service myself in connection with VMs. So the first thing I want to do is to register a tenant, right? So if I'm a new tenant being marketing, I say, hey, I need access to virtual machines. I click on that one. And then I can subscribe to cloud resources saying, I want to define now how much virtual machines do I want to have, how, many, how much RAM, how much uh, CPU should I use. And I'm going to use you how that works. We're not going to go through it all because it takes some time to uh, first create the tenant. So I'm going to give you some examples, and then I'm going to click through so you kind of get a notion of it, because I also want to show you what this looks like in the tools itself. So here you can actually see the way you set, you set it up. You go in, and you install this cloud process pack. Click next, next, next. And here you see a whole guide and an overview that will take you step by step onto how you configure it. And that's what we see here on, on the right side. You can see the different resources that we have. So really what this allows you to do is actually to show how well system center is integrated because this is a very good scenario showing how well virtual machine manager, how well service manager, and how well orchestrator are integrated with each other constantly, constantly exchanging information that each component has to the other component so you constantly drive that synchronization between the products. So with that, I just want to flip over. I hope you'll see that up there now. So I just installed the Cloud Process Pack. And in here, under my configuration items, I quickly get an overview over all the resources that I currently have in Virtual Machine Manager. So instead of sitting over in Virtual Machine Manager all the time and kind of get a quick overlook over, over, the, um, over the clouds that I have, I can, for instance, go in here. And I can say, OK, tell me. Um, for instance, I can go in here and see, OK, 
show me all the service templates that I currently have uh, in, inside a uh, virtual machine manager. But I could also look at um, other things, so as I could see what virtual machines I have. So from in here, it, really, it gives me different views that are similar to the views that I can see in virtual machine manager. But here, I can drive that information to, 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 uh, uh, to run process automation inside uh, my enterprise. So here is a lot of information that gets exposed that is really the job of virtual machine manager. But because we also want to drive this from a standardized approach and a compliance approach, we take all this information and we put it into service manager so I can drive some of my IT processes based on all this data. So just to give you an idea on what that's really looked like, you can kind of see here uh, the different areas. But here, I can also go in and I can look at my cloud. That, that's actually the one thing uh, that I want to show you. So here I can see all my cloud resources that I have. Um, I can see my cost centers. So if I have different cost centers that I have described in here, you can see here I create one for IT services. I have one for finance. I have one for the different tenants that I know. So what I can also do here, if I scroll down a little bit, um, is that over here in, there we go. So here you can actually see all the clouds that I'm currently using that I have available um, over in Virtual Machine Manager. And those are exactly the same that you could just see here before over in Service Manager. And that's really the way we drive the compliance. So what I can do here is that I can go in to my self-service portal that we see here. And this is the picture that I showed you before. I know this looks a little small for the one sitting in the back. So um, I don't think I have zoom in on this one, but I can just go in and zoom in a little bit. Hopefully this just helped a little bit. Um, so in here, I can actually see my different uh, areas that I, can, that I can subscribe to. So here I can, for instance, see request service, request to a tenant. So let me click here. So this comes up, and it will give me a bunch of options that I can use, where I, I go in and say, I'm a new tenant. I'm a, the, uh, I'm a new department here. So here I go in, and I give it a name. So here, for instance, I can say we have a uh, dev department. Uh, so the dev department is the one that does a development. So here I can say, we're going to do a dev request. I can scroll down here, and I can enter the name of the tenant, and I call that tenant dev. I can enter a tenant code here, going, just enter some numbers here. And what you can then see here is that I have human resources, I have marketing, I have development. So here you actually see the different, <clears throat> the different tenants that I have registered already. So here, for instance, I can go in and select development down here. So these informations are the ones that I showed you before that we store in the CMDB. So this is dynamic. So if I go in and create a new one, this will automatically show up if I come in and I want to register a new tenant uh, after a while. So down here, I can click Next. So I will be asked a new set of questions. So here, I can, for instance, say, who is the owner of this tenant subscription that you would like to subscribe to now? And I can type in my email. Sorry about that. And down here, I just type in my um, credentials. And here, I click Next. So what will happen now is that I get a quick overview of the selections that I made, and I can click Submit. So while this one is kicking off, instead of we ask a VMM administrator to sit and, and put in all this data, what I can do here is actually what I'm asking this user to do is what an administrator would normally do over here, where I say create a new cloud. So in here, I can go in, and it will ask me for what are the logical networks that this tenant needs access to. So here I can just do one here. So here we'll be asked a bunch of questions about what, what logical networks to use to have. Um, let me just go down to this one that is really the most interesting one. So here I will, for instance, be asked about the capacity that this cloud uh, can, can deliver. And here we say numbers of CPU and memory and storage. So uh, what we want to do here is that I don't want the VMM administrator to sit and do this every time a new tenant wants access to a new cloud. I want to automate this piece. And that's exactly what we're doing over here. 
where if I go back to the console, what I can do here is that I can go down here and I can click on this one that I showed you before. Oops. I click here, and now I will get back into that menu we saw before. And in here, I can now start clicking and say, I want to request services here, or I want to uh, subscribe to cloud resources. So I will be taking through the same set of questions here, where I'll be asked about how do you want this cloud, what do you want this cloud to look like? What is your consumption model? How many VMs do you want, would you like to use? And that is exactly what you can see here. Who are you? And you will go down here, and you will start to be asked. You see here, numbers of gigabytes. In here, I can say the resource subscription name, so I could call that dev. I can say that this is for the dev department. I can click here, I say one gigabyte. And here, I will be, oh, sorry. So what happens here is I will be asked those questions that we saw in Virtual Machine Manager before when I was creating this private cloud. So now I'm actually asking the self-service user to go in and type in this kind of information. I don't have to do that. And as you can see here, I can click next, next, next to this. And then this service request will then be sent to my manager. will then go in and say, yes, I approve that you now get a cloud called dev with the numbers of virtual machines, with the numbers of uh, memory and gigabyte that you specified in this request. So the virtual machine manager administrator will not have to sit and do that. All this happens automatically behind the scene. When the manager says it's fine with this cloud, orchestrator will automatically go over to virtual machine manager and create this cloud. And the next thing I can then do, which you see here, is that I can actually go back and go in and order a new virtual machine. When I order this virtual machine, I can even set expiring date. I can set uh, other things like name and say it could be signed into Active Directory and it should be members of a, a given network. So this is another way how we can drive this so a virtual machine manager administrator doesn't have to sit and do that. So I mean, you get the concept of how you can drive all the whole life cycle of having clouds and virtual machines for tenants uh, and drive that in an automated fashion and in a standardized way. So that is exactly what uh, that cloud process pack uh, gives to you. So the next thing I want to talk about is the chargeback uh, for enterprise scenarios. So a component we added in Service Pack 1 that we released uh, earlier this year is uh, the capability of doing chargeback. How many of you are doing chargeback today? There's a few ones there. So are you doing chargeback per department or per unit? Or are you doing between the different departments? So how are you doing that today? Is that to customers? Oh, OK. So the idea here is really that we want to change the way that people use virtual environments, just as an example. So Chargeback allows you to go out and say, finance department, you are using a lot of virtual machines and using a lot of very big virtual machines. We want you to pay more than marketing over here that only has a few web servers. So we want it to be fair, and we want it to be transparent. So I don't know if any of you have worked with ITIL, but that was some of the things they talk about when they talk about financial management, that you want it to be fair and you want it to be transparent so the user understands why am I paying what I'm paying based on these cost models that I have. And that is exactly what we want to put in to System Center to allow, to, uh, to allow the IT department to go out and say, hey, please pay for what you're using. So if we look at traditional IT today, uh, at least as, as it was a few years back, it was a lot about physical infrastructure. It was a lot about having an SLA of 99%, uh, maybe over a week, over a month. Um, and the capacity was primarily managed by the consumer in many cases. So what I mean by that was in many cases, the, um, the IT or the different departments went out and bought their own servers, or maybe they went out and bought their own uh, uh, powerful workstations where they could run stuff on. So what we saw with that is that in most cases, the different departments would go out and they would oversubscribe. They would typically go out and ask for more than they needed in reality. Uh, but they, in fact, once they would oversubscribe, over the actual uses they had of those resources were not really using what they were subscribed to. So of course with that, there's a cost recovery that you see with that, that the cost doesn't reflect how we're actually using it. 
And if there's one thing a company or everybody's being asked for is to drive down cost. And if there's one thing this doesn't do is to drive down cost. What it really gives you is that you have a lot of resources that you're not really using, but IT think they're being consumed by a lot of uh, uh, consumers out there, and we really have no control over them. We just know that we have spent a lot of money on this infrastructure. So really what we want to do with the cloud-optimized IT is to take control over those resources by providing pool resources where we take all those resources and say, we put those into resource pools where we administer these so we can have multiple users or departments using the same physical server so we get higher utilization. That is one of the goals. What we also want to do is we want to be more specific about the SLA so it's not in, in, in months or weeks that we're down to um, hours and days. And then we want to take control over those IT resources so we can utilize them better. That's essentially the goal here. So we want to get away from oversubscribing and on that utilize to a model where we define quotas, where we define leasing, where we define approvals, and where we use chargeback and showback. So what we're really doing here is that we charge for the computer units that we allocate. We price that based on clouds and the tenants that we have in there. And then we define a price model based on those private clouds. So you probably heard this before that I, as marketing, go out and I can act, um, request access to two different clouds. I can request access to a Go cloud that is super fast and has high availability. I can request access to a Bronx cloud that is not very fast and doesn't have very, very high availability. And I would then pay different prices for the VMI provision into those clouds. And that's what we're seeing here. So the solution, really what it does, is that we have virtual machine managers today. And this is where we define the clouds. That was where I showed you before. So once we have defined that cloud where we can use the cloud process pack, uh, where I just showed you that I want a new cloud with this amount of VMs, this, this amount of uh, CPUs and memory and so on, that gets created in virtual machine manager. Now, because we integrated virtual machine manager and operations manager, uh, they will constantly exchange data. So virtual machine manager will tell what clouds it has, what virtual machines that are associated to what clouds, and all that information, it would hand that over to operations manager. Because we have operations manager and service manager interacted with what we call connectors, operations manager will deliver CPU data, memory data, uh, disk data, uh, and, and different kind of consumptions into service manager. And over in service manager, this is where we can create these price models, where we define and say a CPU costs $2, memory costs $5 per gigabyte, and a virtual uh, machine in itself costs $2. So then you can certainly start associating a price to the resources that you're consuming from IT, and then we can expose that data in the service manager data warehouse. And here's some example of that where you see where you can go in and define uh, these chart spec models or price sheets as we call them, where you say, in a Go cloud, I want a CPU to cost $5 and uh, it's running on very fast SAN, so SAN per gigabyte costs $10 and so on. What then happens is that if I go out and create a virtual machine, it has four CPUs, it has 20 gigabytes of RAM and it has super fast storage. I would then take the different price indications I have here and calculate that combined so that five times four CPUs is $20 and so on for all the components that is built up of that VM. And then inside the data warehouse, I will then start doing the calculations on what am I paying per month. So here's an example of a price sheet where you can see that you give a dollar amount per VM base price per day. There's one for memory uh, and there's another one for storage. And you can also say other things like uh, if it's highly available or if it has a static IP uh, or if you are able to expanding VHDs and so on. And you can extend this if you want to with other attributes in there. And I will come back with uh, what it takes to do that. Then once I've defined a price sheet, I can then go out and say which clouds that I've created do I associate to these price sheets. So if I have a cloud that I call Go, I can then take and say the price indications that I just had before I'm associating those uh, pri uh, uh, private clouds here to that price sheet, and then we actually know how we find the price for that given VM. Then I can put all this stats into, uh, stuff into a dashboard. I can also put it in no, performance point, where we really will just use existing uh, SQL and Microsoft technologies to expose this data. 
So with that, I really just want to show you how we do this in reality. Hopefully you're seeing that now. So let's go away from uh, this here. So we have Virtual Machine Manager here. Again, you're seeing all these clouds. And in here, I can give these clouds different names. I have one here called Redmond. I have one called Management. How you define these clouds is really up to you if you want to define them by area or you want to define them by price. Um, so that's kind of what you need to come up with a cost model there. Uh, what I just want to emphasize that is important is that you make it fairly transparent and pretty fair about how you put together those um, uh, cost models. Um, if you're interested in knowing more about this, uh, which I will uh, uh, show you in a minute, I created a list of blog posts, uh, three uh, blog posts on chargeback, where I go over some of the reasons that you want to do chargeback, some of the pitfalls, uh, and also some of the discussions you need to take on a management level about how you want to go in and do this. Uh, so there's a lot of process to it more than it's actually about putting it into the tool. The process side of that, agreeing on how you want to charge and how you come up with these charging models is a very important piece of when you sit down and do this. So here we see the different clouds. What I can then do is over in Service Manager, I can go into the same window that I used before, uh, but under administration here, you actually have this window here called Chargeback. And in here, you can see uh, some of the information that we're exchanging. I have two areas here. I have the clouds. Those are the ones that I just showed you before over in Virtual Machine Manager. I can click here, and you will see all the clouds that I currently have in Virtual Machine Manager. Those are exactly the same that I showed you before uh, over in the other place. And those data constantly get pushed from Virtual Machine Manager over into uh, Service Manager. The next thing I can then take a look at is actually all my price sheets. And you can see here that I created a Contoso price sheet uh, and another price sheet here. So if I double click on this one, You can see that I just give it a name. Here you can see the different prices that are associated to it. Um, so $5, $1, $1, $1. And here's then the important thing where I go in and associate the private clouds that I showed you in Virtual Machine Manager into here so you can see right now Finance Cloud and Marketing Cloud will be bound by the price sheets that I'm just defining over here. So that's really how we go in and define it. And that means every time I create a new virtual machine in that cloud over there, I would apply these price tags to that virtual machine. So the next thing you will then ask yourself, OK, how do I then actually start doing this chargeback? Um, what we can do here is that we have two things. Either you can use performance point uh, that will then show you this data in uh, SharePoint. I'm going to show you an example of that later on when we come to Viberverse um, uh, part of the presentation. Um, what I want to give you some idea of how that works is uh, how we can actually use Power Pivot. How many of you know Power Pivot in Excel? There's a few people there, okay. So for those of you that haven't heard about Power Pivot, what that allows you to do is that normally if I have a database, I would have to understand the nature of this database and how to put together queries that will return the data. What I can do with Power Pivot and what we call analysis services in SQL is that I can go in there and I can define various attributes of how this database is put together. So I, as an end user, don't have to know anything about SQL queries. I can go out and utilize the way uh, this data is, uh, this cube is structured inside this database. So I can slice and dice data on the fly. So for instance, if I want to see all VMs that is older than two years that is currently not running, I can go in and select those parameters in the uh, power pivot in the way that the cube itself is exposing that data so I don't have to know anything about SQL. And I'm definitely not a SQL guy, but I think it took me about half an hour to sit and play with power pivot and these cubes that comes out of the box for service manager just to make simple chargeback models. I'm going to show you what that looks like. So here in the console, we have this area called data warehouse. In Data Warehouse, we have here what we call cubes. Um, so cubes are the ones that defines how we structure this data. So normally this takes a little time to load, but normally I can click here on cube. Then once the list of cube comes up, I click on analyze uh, cubes in Excel. I cheated a little bit here because I know it was going to take it a few seconds to compute this. 
So here I actually have a spreadsheet that I simply just opened. I clicked on Analyze Cube in Excel, and this opened. So the next thing I can do here is I can go in and say, I want to understand how much money I have spent on the virtual machines that I put into marketing and into uh, finance. So here I can, for instance, just go in and say, OK, let me give me an idea over the calendar year in, in, a, in a hierarchy state. So in here you can see, for instance, it says 2003. I can double click on this one. Uh, that will then show the different quarters, so it says uh, um, Q1 and Q2. I can click on that, and I can then see each month within that quarter. So I can typically do drill down. Now, what I also want to do here, maybe I want to associate uh, some numbers to this. So in this case, I can go up here, for instance, and I can say, how much does a cloud cost for me? I can click here, and you can see um, instantly it's coming up with the numbers that is based on those price sheets I created before. So I can very quickly see what is the cost per quarter or per month. And I can even drill further down into a date if I wanted to do that. But I can also add more data to this. So I can just say, how much did I pay for CPU? How much did I pay for, uh, let me see here, cores in days? I can also take other ones. Let's say memory is another good one. Uh, so you can constantly see that I can go in, and I can just drill down and get more detailed information on these areas. Uh, so I quickly get an understanding on uh, how I'm spending my money. And, and I see this is, I'm not doing anything here. I really, this is what I kind of found out after playing with this uh, between 15 minutes and, and, and half an hour. You can sit and start drilling on this data. And you can see I can even click on this. And I will drill further down to say, OK, tell me how much money I spent in June. And you can slice and dice this by using all these parameters out here. Uh, and I can just click any one of them, and it will return data that would, would so of course, deal with that area. Uh, and that is very valuable to me, because I don't know anything about SQL. I don't want to sit down and start dealing with in and out of joints and all that stuff. I just want to click these and slice and dice that data on the fly. Um, one question I get a lot is normally people say, but how do I then understand when to use performance point? That works in a similar way, and when should I use uh, power pivot? What I normally say is that use power um, performance point when you want to expose um, typically uh, KPIs or key performance indicators to businesses at a higher level. Like what is the total cost per department or what is the total cost or, uh, per this or how much disk are we using per cloud, stuff like that. Something that you would normally put on a video wall when people walk into the IT room and looks up there and say, Oh, OK, I can see finance is using quite a bit of money right now. Uh, so, so think about that in, in those terms. Where you can use Power Pivot uh, could be an example is that if I, as a um, specialist, wants to sit down and understand what virtual machines I currently have that I'm spending the most money on, and I want to compare that with why is this virtual machine very expensive every second Wednesday of the month? What's going on there? I want to understand why I'm spending this money then I would use uh, Power Pivot to, to drill in for that data. So this is really how I can go in and very, very easily uh, slice and dice uh, this data. So with that, I just want to flip it back here. So what we also have here is that we have made some extensions uh, to this where Shikant, my colleague, has um, created some white papers that we have heard some questions from somebody saying, hey, if I wanted to add something else to this price sheet, uh, for instance, that I wanted to charge for if this stuff is running on a special SAN that I have running rate 10, that I want to charge more for that, then I can do a checkbox. Uh, we have step-by-step -step guides here on how you can actually extend those price sheets with some data you have underneath that you want to add to your cost model. So I'm not going through it, but it's just for you to give an idea what it would take. And also, um, this presentation will be uploaded to um, the Take It uh, website. And you can click on this link, and you can go in and directly download this if you want to extend this price sheet. Um, also, if you want to uh, uh, extend the chargeback for a, a new VM property, uh, that's the exact same thing. You see the steps here, what it takes to, to do it at a high level. Uh, go and click on this link we have here, and you can actually drill in and see uh, step by step on how you can do uh, deeper uh, chargeback on some attributes. 
what we also get asked a lot is that um, does this charge pack go beyond uh, VMs? And the answer to that right now is no. Uh, so if you, for instance, wanted to do charge pack on mailboxes, if you wanted to do charge pack per SharePoint websites or farms, stuff like that, uh, we have a partner called Cloud Cruiser actually sitting up here uh, that has done an extension to System Center that allows you to do um, much more advanced uh, charge pack on uh, other IT services than, uh, than VMs. So if you're interested in that, come up here and, and you can uh, talk to a Cloud Cruiser person right here that can help you understand a little bit about that. What I'm showing you here, everything that I've showed here is totally out of the box. So with that, um, I want to go into the tenant subscription and usage and some of the new stuff that Wiper is going to uh, tell us about in, in, our, in our two, right? Well, we had some of it in R1, yep. and so we take won, it away. and we have some of it in V2 as well. Um, so let's go a little bit into tenant usage. Um, just before I start, um, how many of you guys, by a show of hands, have heard about the Windows Azure pack? Wow. Woohoo, OK. So um, how many have you, uh, of you have actually downloaded it, tried it? Nice. Um, um, have you guys by any chance tried the V1 version of the product, which was called the Windows Azure Services for Windows Server? Awesome. Have you had a chance to actually plug into the usage billing endpoints and APIs and try that out? Okay, you can do that after this session then. <laughs> okay, so um, really with um, usage, and I'm not sure if you're able to see me though, okay. Um, with usage, we, um, as part of the Windows Azure pack, we have a diverse set of services. So we have the VM clouds, we have websites, we have databases with SQL, MySQL, and we have Service Bus. Now, with these diverse set of services, you have a bunch of um, tenants who sign up for these services, and you have a bunch of resource utilization that happens across these services, and they're very different kinds of resource utilization. Now, figuring out how much each tenant has used of each resource, of each service, right, is a hard problem. And we want to help you solve that problem. And we want you to get that data from us in a very consistent manner so that you can then grab that data both for billing purposes and for analytics. Now, with analytics, um, you will be able to see trends of how people use the different resources, and then you will be able to potentially upsell certain different parts of the system in terms of different services or different uh, coda limits for each of these resources um, by using this analytic data. Now, one of the important things that uh, we recognize and we want to enable is pay as you go. Now, this is actually one of the things that we learned from Windows Azure and we want to bring to on-premise. Now, pay-as-you-go is the ability for you to give your tenants the chance to pay for only the resources that they consume. Now, there are a lot of people who use static allocation-based billing models, and this works for a lot of people. Um, but what we think gives you a true competitive advantage is the ability to charge only for what the tenant uses. And so they feel um, comfortable paying for what they use against paying large amounts up front. So with this system, we want to enable you to do that. And we also understand the, the elastic model of these cloud services, and we want to provide micro and macro level analytic, analytic data to help you um, analyze consumptions. Now, there are four uh, key things that you're going to get out of the box as part of this system. One is continuous usage metering per tenant subscription. Now, here we kind of go into the details of how this comes for the IaaS stack. For the IaaS stack, this data is captured in OM for CPU, memory, storage, network. And from OM via SPF, it is available to the Windows Azure Pack usage collection service. Now, along with IaaS, we also have websites data that comes from the website usage endpoints, and we have the databases data that come from the SQL usage endpoints and the MySQL usage endpoints. Along with this, we have a, per, we have a billing API that is available as part of the Windows Azure Pack usage service. This is a REST-based API. This is the API that actually gives you that consistent data across these different resource providers. 
and it gives you one way to get that data. Um, that data consists of both resource utilization as well as plans, subscriptions, and add-ons information. Now, some of these concepts of plans, add-ons, and subscriptions, um, in case you're not familiar with already, um, there's a session today at 5 o'clock by Mark and Anjali that Anders mentioned, and that'll go deeper into the architecture of the Windows Azure Pack and some of these concepts as well. The third thing that we're enabling here is an IaaS data warehouse. Now, what this does is actually we have a, a service called Service Reporting that goes and grabs data from the billing APIs and then populates a data warehouse. This time, it's specifically for IaaS data. Hopefully, it's extensible for the other providers as well. But in this case, it enables IaaS data to be available in the form of cubes so you can do analysis on top of them and build out and custom reports. What, one other thing that we're offering as part of this system is server inventory reports and other kind of sample reports that will help you, um, one, understand what are the types of reports that can be enabled via the cubes, as well as um, some of these out-of-box reports will help you with um, SPLA compliance. Now, um, with the overall um, uh, offering in mind, let's go a little bit into the actual architecture of how this happens within the Windows Azure Pack. Um, we have two parts of this architecture, actually. So the first part of this is the Windows Azure Pack segment. And the second part of this is the consumers of the data that comes out of the Windows Azure Pack. So for the Windows Azure pa Pack part of the segment, we basically have the different providers that I spoke about. So we have VMs, websites, service bus, SQL, and MySQL. Also, the, the cool thing here is that you can plug in third-party providers and have them kind of comply with the same usage endpoint requirements of the system. And for these custom providers, you can pump in the same kind of usage data, and the usage service will collect that data in exactly the same manner that it does for the out-of-box um, providers. The usage collector service, what it really does is that it is configured to every once in a while go across these different providers, both inbox and the external ones, and grab data for them and save it as part of the usage database. Now, this also enables there is a REST endpoint as part of the usage system that, that allows different types of consumers to come grab that data uh, for different kinds of purposes. This data is, uh, consists of offers, subscriptions, plans, add-ons, and resource consumption usage information. Some of the consumers that we have as part of the system, two uh, ver uh, consumers that are typical are, one, a billing system. So we want people to be enabled to do monthly, weekly billing reports um, and invoices uh, using this data. So you would have to have a billing adapter that kind of translates the data that comes out of this pipeline into the language that is understood by a billing system. And the second kind of um, capability is analytics. Now, we want this data to, uh, to be used for analytics and, uh, again, for going over trends of usage. Um, what we are offering out of box is service reporting, which is going to grab that data and then create cubes and have those out of box reports. For the billing system, we're working with certain providers uh, and partners who are going to help us build this thing out. Uh, we are working to get more partners and more, uh, create a more healthy ecosystem, but we have um, Clark Truser who has helped us uh, do this. And um, one thing that's not represented here is that we're also kind of enabling the ability to pump back pricing information from a billing system back into the Windows Azure Pack portals, such that when your tenant goes to try to buy a plan or an add-on, it actually displays uh, pricing information of what they're going to buy. Um, so with that, I will, oh, one last thing. Um, this is kind of um, a high level, the, the contract that we use, which really enables the inbox providers as well as third-party providers to pass data into the user system. It's a very generic kind of contract. It goes basically over events and time slots. So it says this particular resource was consumed from this time to this time. Um, it comes from this particular service type. So it comes from VMs or websites or SQL, MySQL. 
it is associated with this subscription ID, so that particular tenant gets charged for it, and co the collections that we have for properties and resources actually goes into a very rich set of resources. Um, an example for VMs, you've had CPU, memory consumptions, um, network, bandwidth, and for uh, websites, you have a set of um, resource types that are consumed as, uh, that are uh, passed as well. So with that, I will hand it back to Anders to do a quick demo. So, uh, that's cool, we have, we have uh, at least 10 minutes left. That means that I can geek a little bit more than, uh, so that's actually really good. Um, so let me just uh, flip over here. So, um, whoops. That was not supposed to happen, but let's see if. Uh... So what I want to show you here, while I just talk a little bit about that, is that just like with Service Manager, um, we're kind of using similar technology here to uh, to make use of that data. So, so how many of you are using the Service Manager Data Warehouse? There's a few there. So what we're doing here is that we are using similar technology. Uh, so to extract that data that Viper I just talked about, we are going into uh, this usage database by using what we call ETL, uh, Extract Transfer Load. Uh, and this enables us to actually, with a given time interval, to hook into this database and drag out the information on the various areas that we want to do analysis on. What happens then is that, let me just see here, hopefully, is that we then again uses uh, another Microsoft technology that we already have called uh, um, SQL Analysis Services that where we out of the box provide you with cubes that will slice and dice this data and present it in a way that allows you to use the exact same technology that I just showed you, I just showed you before with this spreadsheet. So I'm going to show you a similar thing where we have this spreadsheet where we can pull out data. But then on top of that, what I'm going to do after that is to show you how you can actually use Performance Point and present this data in a SharePoint view or a SharePoint farm. Uh, and then once you've presented that data here, how you can actually slice and dice on that data. Um, given we have a little extra time uh, left, I'm actually going to show you how you can go in and build your own dashboard. A lot of people go, oh, this is Performance Point. Uh, this is super uh, advanced and very difficult. Um, I'm not going to make it all, but at least I'm going in here and I'm showing you how we can uh, create a, uh, a dashboard in here. Hmm. Okay, so one thing we can do here, and I can tell they're using this down in the booth, uh, which they were not. So that's one of the limitations we have here. We don't have that many demo environments, and right now I'm actually using the environment that they have uh, down in the booth. So here, uh, you can see that, uh, let me just find it right. You can see here that just like before, it's the same things that you can go in and enable here, where you can slice and dice with data, um, given the way that those are exposed via the cube. So in here, for instance, we can go in and say, what is daily core uh, allocation here? So I can see we have 188 uh, cores allocated in the clouds that I currently have per tenant. So the cool thing about this is that it has the notions of both a tenant. So if I'm a customer uh, Contoso and I go in, I can ask to get the systems in two ways. I can go in and ask for very specific data about a given VM, but I can also ask about consumptions across all my VMs or across all my clouds that I'm consuming for that tenant. So it has the notion of that, and therefore it can go across all these VMs and all these clouds that I'm subscribed to and give me total consumption of, for instance, networking for CPUs, per, for, for VMs. Um, so it certainly becomes a lot easier for me to slice and dice data 
at a macro layer, but also at a, a micro layer uh, for a given VM or for the whole tenant. So what I can do here, as you can see, is that I can go ahead here and I can click the different values based on what I need. So I can, for instance, say what is RAM, what is daily statistic memory allocation. And remember what I'm showing here is for the whole tenant. It's across the whole thing uh, for that specific customer. Um, and then if I wanted to, I could go uh, down into another cube area and I can then start um, analyzing on a specific VM within a given tenant and, and pull out data on that. So very much same concepts as I showed with Service Manager, except that we're going against, um, um, I would say, more agile data as we have the notions of a tenant which Service Manager doesn't have in the same way. So if you're a service provider, this is probably an easier way for you to go uh, because it has the notions of both tenants and the VMs that are in there. So um, what we have here is the um, dashboard that you can create. Uh, so what I want to show you here is that, personally, I don't think this is a very good dashboard. Can you see what's, what this dashboard is all about? So I actually want to create another dashboard. This, is, this dashboard is super cool and it's good if I had a little higher resolution on a screen so this would show a little better. So what I want to do here is to actually go in and create a new dashboard. So let me just go here and go into the dashboard designer. So here we can actually see the different dashboards we have. So here I have demo reporting, uh, and here you can see I have the other uh, dashboard that I just showed you. So if I have performance point right here, you can see dashboard designer. So this will open up at the, the dashboard designer where it will now enable me to create a new dashboard. So there's some things that we're going to provide out of the box. So we will provide the cubes that we just talked about. So those you don't have to create yourself, so we present the right uh, data points that you can go in and query on. Um, what we will also uh, provide, I believe, so please correct me if I'm wrong, is that we will provide you some of these dashboard examples so you can easily go in and create your own. And what I'm showing you here is just an example of that I uh, just pre-created. The only thing I pre-created here is actually the data model uh, things or the queries against the database. So here you can actually see that I specified um, the, what we call an analytic charts, where I go in and, and do a given um, query against the database. So this is very similar to what I showed you before in, the, um, uh, in Power Pivot, where I go in and say, please show me total CPU consumption per month. Um, this is the exact same thing I added in here in these uh, analytic charts. But what I want to do now is actually I want to create a new dashboard. So I can right-click here, and then I say New Dashboard. And this one, uh, let's say we take this one, three rows. I click OK. So now we've actually come up with this uh, new dashboard where I can start filling in the analytic charts that I just created, uh, that I pre-created um, already. Uh, those takes a little time, and you need to sit down and query that against the database and stuff, or against the cube. So I don't have time to make that here, but um, it, it's not that hard to create these. It takes a little study. Um, you can browse the web and, and look at data analytics and, and performance point and, and, and get a feeling of how that works. Um, so here I'm going to call this dashboard taken. Down here you can see, um, I can click here on, on reports. Um, And if I click down here, I should be able to. I'm not sure why they're not showing. I'm probably not using the right. Uh... OK. What I do here, uh, of course, I, I created one. I have one here called demo reporting. Let me, let me edit that one instead. Um, so if I double click on this one, you can actually see that I have these that they already empty. So the same thing I just did before, but out here, you see here I have um, core analyzed clouds, I have disk space, and I have VM. Um, so I can actually take these here, and I can drag and drop them just, uh, over here. 
So here you can, for instance, take that one and drag and drop it. Oh, hold on. So here I just took this one and dragged and dropped it over here. Here I can take, let me just remove this. Sorry about this. So here I literally just take these where I say cores across clouds. So that's how many CPUs I'm using uh, across my clouds. I take this one and drag and drop that one down here. Let me try again. My mouse is not working very well. You see, I just drag and drop it down. I take this one VM runtimes across cubes, drag and drop it. Oh, let me try again. There we go. And then I can take the last one and say disk across clouds. Oh, I just put it in there. I'm not going to troubleshoot this, but you can see now I just took these parameters that I had before, these analyzing queries that I did. I just dragged and dropped them in here to the dashboard. So what I can do here is literally just take this demo dash reporting here, right-click on it, and say deploy to SharePoint. So what it would do now is it will take those uh, queries that I just created here, and it will take those and put them in to a dashboard, and it will now, in a few seconds, open up that dashboard uh, inside SharePoint. So I can then direct anybody that wants to know about their consumption on this given cloud into this uh, SharePoint site. So the idea with this, as I mentioned before, is that you can go in and you can create these dashboards, um, typically the ones that you would put up on your wall, and then you can very easily communicate to your users what their current consumption is. Or if you're a service provider, you can go in and expose this inside SharePoint. So when the service provider, log or when the tenant logs in to their portal, they will see what um, their consumption is instead of having to call you all the time. And what is the good thing about this is that it's updating live. So when I go in and I query data on this, it would actually update that data uh, directly from the database. So it's not a set point in time data that I'm, uh, that I'm getting from uh, this, uh, that I'm getting from uh, that dashboard that I'm creating. This is taking a little time. So uh, in the meantime, I'm just going back to this dashboard where I can take this guy here. And here, we're just going to open this dashboard. Oh, that actually comes. So this is the other one that just opened. And here you can actually see it's loading the three things that I just pulled over. And here I can actually go in and I can see the bronze cloud, the gold cloud, the silver cloud, and the unknown cloud. And here I can see that it's, uh, it's clearly the gold cloud that is using the most resources right now. But what I can do with performance point is actually I can do a similar kind of drilling that I did inside uh, my power pivot where I could drill down on a financial year and then I could see quarters and months. This is similar where I can right click on this one. So wouldn't it be cool now that I'm a tenant and say, whoa, I can see I'm spending a lot of money on the gold cloud, that if I wanted to understand what VM is actually using all that money, uh, that I could actually go in and I could drill into that specific VM. So what I can do here is that I can say drill down And it's just loading. Um, so once I can do here is I can drill down on that specific Go cloud. It will go in, and then it will actually analyze on the different parameters that I can drill down on. And all this is based inside the cubes that they will tell you, OK, based on this, you can actually go in and, and drill in on these. I'm not sure why this one is not loading. Let me try to see if I can get it to load a little better. Yeah, here we go. So here I can, for instance, go down and say virtual machines. Now I want to understand, tell me what virtual machines that I have in there is actually the ones that is using this. This can be a little bit hard to see, so I can just double click here. So we zoom in on this graph individually. This should come up in just a second. And now you can actually see that the one virtual machine that is spending all this money is the guy that I see right here. So I can see that that is a a uh, Shikan test silver cloud machine that is spending all these resources. So with this, you can actually just right click on it. I can even right click on this guy here 
and do even more, if I wanted to, do even more drill down on other values in there. So even though you're looking at this as a video world thing, you can still go in and do drill down to understand more specifics about certain data that you want to uh, get deeper insight to. So as you can see, with this data warehouse that we're providing with the Windows Azure pack, using existing Microsoft technologies as SQL Analyzer, using Power Pivot on top of that, as well as performance points, we can, in a very agile and, and effective way, present data to the end users and drive charge back from the scenarios uh, that we talked about earlier today. Um, see if there's anything. Let me just flip back. So the key takeaways from this presentation is really that with the cloud service process pack, what we give you there is that we give you a package where we have already done a lot of the work for you already. We have done the work for you in service manager where we have created the different um, service request offerings in the self-service portal. We have done the different workloads inside service manager with approval and similar things in there so we stay compliant with the standards we have defined. We have created the workflows in orchestrator so we actually go in and talk to a virtual machine manager based on those scenarios that we created uh, in um, the self-service portal. So I can create a new tenant, I can create new VMs, and similar. What we then did on top of that is also that we provided all this for the whole life cycle that I create a new tenant, I create access to resources, I provision VMs, I can delete VMs, and so on. The next thing we talked about was really how System Center allows you to do chargeback using System Center, uh, and this is primarily based on the enterprise where you don't really are that interested in the notions of tenants like you are if you're a service provider. Um, where we use Virtual Machine Manager, we use Ops Manager, and we use Service Manager, and the Service Manager Data Warehouse, um, and we present the data in Power Pivot or in Performance Point. And then lastly, Viper here talked about the design and the new functions and features and architecture of the Windows Azure Pack usage capabilities that would allow hosters to go in and do uh, very advanced billing and chargeback um, uh, using those APIs that, that we talked about. And then lastly, I showed actually how we can present some of that data in Performance Point and in Power Pivot. So, so hopefully this actually gave you a pretty good life cycle about how you can manage it using the system center tools, but also how you can do the chargeback depending on if you're a service provider or if you're enterprise. Anything you want to add? No, I think we're set to ask okay. questions. Yeah, so if you have any questions, uh, please feel free either to come up or ask them out in the audience, yeah? Um, can we have a mic that, so we can hear? Yeah, we, uh, we want the recording, we want to capture this question uh, in the recording. Uh, so it would be really good with, with a mic. Hi, uh, we saw before that on the pricing, that was based on a daily base. Is it possible in the future, or maybe by extending the the, the chargeback, chargeback uh, features to actually do that hourly or on other base because that's something that our clients asked and so I'm really interested about that. You want to take that? Um, is this specific to uh, VM data? Um, I mean, um, I set up the chargeback on so, um, service manager, and in that case, it's about VM, virtual machines, but uh, in particular, I mean, that could be referred to, I mean, also Okay, I want to understand storage. that scenario a little better, so come up, we can take it offline, uh, because I want to understand some of the details a little better. Sure. This, uh, so, but right now, you have a daily chargeback. Actually, I don't think the mic is working. <laughs> it's very hard to hear you. Yeah, you have the same, so, I mean, um, what I understood was that um, he was saying within SM for chargeback, he wants to understand if, if it can be done at an hourly basis. Oh, okay. For example. So you want better granularity on what is in service manager based on that data? Because, uh, yeah, you can actually measure the um, consumption of the, the resources on a daily basis. Then you can add a price based on uh, how, how much you consume in yeah. a day. That in Hyper-V, you can measure... I mean, all these parameters kind of real time, 
uh, operation man managers allows you to actually track the usage kind of hourly, I think. Yeah. So right now I'm kind of confused about where what I can do in service manager about the chargeback because I can put a price on a daily basis and yeah. I don't know if yeah. actually. Yeah. Okay, I, I, mean, I understand the question now. So, so what you're asking is you, you want more granularity on the details that you can do reporting or you can do chargeback on. Right now, unfortunately, we only do it on a, on, a, on a daily basis. Do you do it on an hourly? So if you want to go more detailed than that, you would have to talk to Cloud Cruiser to do that. Out of the box, we provide it on a daily basis. What we, what we want to do going forward is to leverage the uh, Windows Azure Pack usage capabilities. And, and that will give you much more granular data points that you can analyze on down to the hour. Uh, but we don't have any current plans on doing that in Service Manager, unfortunately. Okay. Another one? Sure. What happens if I change the pricing and I had the same, I mean, the same price sheet to a cloud? Do I have the data from that moment on with the new chart, with the new pricing? Or is that going to change? I mean, it maybe could be sound stupid, but I, I was just want to make sure that if if the, uh, the previous collected data are going to be charged on, I mean, visible on, on, on a report with the new prices, or I, if, on the other hand, from that moment on, I'm going to have the VM consumption with the new price, and the clients are going to be aware of that. Uh, so are you asking if a single VM would be, that, that does it, it does that at a cloud level. Um, so if you wanted to do that per VM, they would also have to be associated to that cloud and apply no, that course. price sheet. So you cannot go more granular or do a price sheet directly to a VM or to sub VMs on the cloud. Is that what you mean? No, I just oh, okay. then it's come a, up and we'll talk about it. To make sure that if I have a cloud with a price sheet and then I want to make a discount and say from that moment on you're gonna pay you no know, one dollar per hour per day, and then I mean, from okay. that moment on, or Let maybe come up and we talk about it yeah. here because I also want to make sure if there are other questions that we take that because we run a little bit over time, but we can take that offline. Uh, but I'm sure I, once I understand it a little better, I can for sure answer. So let's take it offline. Any other last questions before we? Uh, we have somebody down? at the back. Uh, in your example, the tenants were from the same company. If uh, what if they are from the different company? Um, so his question is: uh, In your example, your tenants were from the same company. Yeah. But what if they're from different companies? Okay. So uh, that's a good question. Thank you. So if you're talking about the charts back in uh, Service Manager, the way it works there, it doesn't have the same notions of tenants. But you could treat them as tenants. But you would have to extend the chargeback form to understand that because you would have to tag it somehow to understand uh, who they belong to. But if, if the scenario is that one tenant can have multiple clouds, you would have to encounter for that in your price sheet and do that manually. Where if you use uh, the tenant feature in the Windows Azure pack, it already has that notion of a tenant of a customer uh, and can do that. So it's much more powerful of understanding a multi-tenancy world. Uh, of how that mapping is between a VM and a cloud and a tenant, where the uh, system center uh, chargeback module can do it, but the actual way that you map the price to the tenant would have to be done manually over in the, um, uh, in the analytics part of it. Uh, and it's not, you would have to extend uh, the pricing sheet with some information that would help you to drill down on that data. So it's not straight out of the box. It could be done, but if you are a service provider, I would probably be more reluctant. I would probably advise you to take a deeper look at the usage model because it gives you a lot more of that data that you need on a simple plan. So within the Windows Azure Pack, you have the notions of accounts, so account owners. You have subscriptions within those account owners, and you also have the notions of plans. So different plans could be assigned to different sets of people. So by understanding who's who is subscribed to a particular plan or the user, you'll actually be able to figure out uh, who, is, who is the person who's consuming it. So if a particular set of your users are assigned 
uh, a particular set of user IDs, or if your particular set of users are assigned to a particular plan, you'll be able to uh, definitely figure out which, uh, who consumed what from one company to another. So if you have any more questions, I, I suggest that we uh, close the presentation here, both for the recording. Please give us evaluation. We want to hear about what you're thinking, if we should change anything, if we do this another time. Uh, but feedback in general, let us know what, uh, what, you, what you think about this. Uh, and hopefully, I know it's late on the day, there are two sessions you have to pick between now if you're a service provider. And I know it's not fair. Either you can come over to the next session I'm doing in 15 minutes, where I will talk about how we implemented System Center and Windows Server as service providers around the world. That's one option. The other option, which is probably more cool, I have to admit that, is to go to Mark's and Angelis session that talks about the Windows Azure pack beyond the usage that we talked about, but talks about how you can be a, uh, a, a tenant and how you can be an administrator and how you can drive that whole service provider experience from those portals. Uh, being a service provider. So you have to, it's not an easy choice. You can go for either one of those two, um, but I promise you it's going to be a lot about service providers, and we're going to give you a lot of good details on that that can help you when you go back home. So with that, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. And have a great take -out.